Hello, welcome to the OSPF Segment Routing Configuration Learning Byte. I'm Gordon Mosby with the Education Services Department at Juniper Networks. Let's get started. After successfully completing this learning byte, you will be able to configure OSPF on a Junos platform to support segment routing. The configuration is really minimal. We're, the example uses OSPF as the IGP, and we're going to extend that protocol or enable that protocol to exchange segment routing information. So under the Edit Protocols OSPF branch of the configuration hierarchy, you'll see a, a source packet routing option. So there's a couple of configuration options we'll have to define. And well, I'll start with first the segment routing global block. So under Set Source Packet Routing, we'll say Set a Segment Routing Global Block, and you'll have to configure a start label. Now the segment routing global block in a segment routing domain is uh, used as a source IDs, SIDs, segment IDs. We're going to use them in this example for the node SIDs, right? And this is a value, the start label, that ideally you would like to have be the same on every node that's going to participate in your segment routing domain. We're going to have a six node network in our example that I'll show you on the next slide. So we're going to set a start label of, in this example, of 800,000, and I define a range of labels. Now, again, these SIDs, these IDs will be used for node SIDs. They can be used for adjacency SIDs, prefix SIDs, and so I'm specifying a range of 4,000 SIDs that can be sourced from this segment routing global block. And again, ideally, these values will be the same on all nodes in your segment routing domain. It's not a requirement, but for sanity's sake, it's kind of a, a good known starting point for, for this to be the same on every node. And then within this segment routing block, each node that participates in the domain will need its own unique index value. Then on Juno's devices, just by default, the segment routing global block start label, 800,000 in this example, and the IPv4 index values are combined together to form the node SID. And so in this case, this device is VMX2. I'll show you in the diagram here on the next slide. And so I set the, the IPv4 index to 102. So its node SID would be generated by these two values and be 800,102. We'll, we'll set that, right? And then uh, there's an optional piece. You do not have to do this. You're done. This is all you have to do to enable segment routing. The adjacency SIDs will automatically be generated. The node SIDs will automatically be generated. And then information is distributed throughout the OSPF area, right? Done. But to help me understand segment routing, a lot of the information, for example, the adjacency SIDs that segment routing requires to establish forwarding paths throughout the domain are automatically generated. They're random numbers dynamically generated when the adjacencies are established. And it made it a little hard for me to understand how traffic would flow. So I went ahead and took the optional step of defining a static range. You don't have to do this. It just helped me understand my network better because I knew what numbers I should see because I statically configured them, right? So under the Edit Protocols MPLS branch, you can configure an optional static label range. I'm going to do that because under the interface configuration for Area 0, this device has two interfaces, Gigi 001 and 002. I'm going to go ahead and configure a static adjacency SID. And then this would be the adjacency SID that would be distributed to my OSPF peers, right? So that's some optional configuration that I'm going to enable. Here's our network. We'll use for our example six VMX nodes. We have VMX1 as a provider edge router that is also, you know, performing a similar role, similar role VMX2 as a provider edge router. And then as core routers, P routers in the MPLS world, we have VMX3. VMX4, 5, and 6. Here's the node SIDs that we will configure. Again, I just tried to make the numbers make sense. VMX1, it will have a node SID of 800,101. VMX2 would end in 2, and in 3, and 4, and 5, and 6. The loopback interfaces that we'll take a look at that are, you know, of course, by default used as router IDs to, you know, where did this router announcement come from? Also, you know, it, dot one, you know, ends in dot two, dot three, dot four. So we tried to make the numbers match so it'll be easy for you to see. So all of these routers, uh, v, uh, except VMX1, currently have, OS, they all have OSPF configured, but VMX1 is the only router 
in this domain that does not have segment routing enabled. So we're, I'm going to connect to VMX1, enter configuration mode, and we'll enter the minimum configuration uh, necessary to have him participate in the segment routing domain. And, and then we'll statically, as the optional component, configure the static adjacency SIDs. Okay? And so let me connect to VMX1, and we'll do that now. Okay, this is the VMX1 node. Let me enter configuration mode. And I'm going to start first. I want to go under Edit Protocols MPLS. Now, again, this is the portion that you don't really have to, to do, but it, it helped me. I want to go ahead and set a label range uh, that, that I can use uh, for, for statically assigning adjacency SIDs. And you, you just specify a range of labels. I just picked uh, from 1,000 to 2,000. You pick whatever. Uh, numbers make sense to you. This allowed my numbers to work for me. So that's all I really have to enable. So I'm going to go down now to the Edit Protocols OSPF branch. Let's take a look at what we have. I, I have just Area 0. This VMX1 node has two interfaces that are participating in the OSPF domain. Just And this is fine. Traffic engineering is turned on. So there's a, a traffic engineering database that's maintained as well, but I want to enable segment routing. So again, the, the simple command under this hierarchy is, is to set source packet routing. Now we want to configure our segment routing global block. We want to define our start label. Uh, you can pick a number that works for you. I, I picked 800,000 as my very first label. And then I picked a range, which was completely more labels than I need in my small network of 4,000. But it gave me plenty, and it matched with kind of the example I used to learn this concept. So there's my start label, and then my range of labels that I wanted to find. Now, under that source packet routing branch, I need to uniquely identify this particular node, right? And we do that by defining the node segments IPv4 index value. And this is the value that is unique for every node in the domain. Since this is VMX1, I, I define the IPv4 index of 101. You know, VMX2 is 102 and 3 is 103. And, and those values, again, by default on a Junos device would cause this node and other nodes in the network that have learned this information to realize that VMX1 has a node SID of 800,101. Right? That's if I wanted to forward traffic in an MPLS frame from one end of the network, let's say VMX2 to VMX1, the idea is I could use that node segment, that node SID, as an MPLS label, put it in the head of an MPLS frame and forward it across my network, and all of the other routers that were participating in the segment routing domain would know where to forward that traffic so it would reach VMX1, right? This uniquely identifies VMX1 in this segment routing domain. This can be used as an MPLS label. And so we've set that value. Now, uh, the optional piece is under area zero. I want to go ahead and set the static adjacency SIDs. And so I do that under the IPv4 adjacency segment portion. I'm going to set an unprotected label. Uh, this will be the adjacency SID of 1012. This is the IP address that this interface uses of the OSPF peer reachable through Gigi001. It's 172.22.101.2. So I made the adjacency SID 101.2, right? I just try to keep things simple. I, and, and, and for the Gigi2 interface, I'm going to set the adjacency SID to manually be uh, 102.2, right? And, and so that's the optional component. Let me commit this, right? And there's a couple of commands that I, I want to show now to you. So let me let me do a show OSPF neighbor detail command, right? A detail or extensive would work in this output. And I can see that the VMX1 node, right, has out this interface, right? I have a neighbor. Here's the IP address of the neighbor uh, that I'm connected to outside of this interface. It's a full adjacency. This is the router ID of that neighbor. Uh, 20.3 is VMX3. So VMX1 has an OSPF adjacency with VMX3. It's full adjacency. They're both in area zero. And segment routing has been enabled. 
and I can actually see the adjacency labels or in segment routing terminology, the adjacency SIDs. I statically configured it, right? And this, again, you don't have to do that. It'll randomly generate that, but it helped me be able to match this with something that I knew. And, and here's the other adjacency that VMX1 has out the Gigi002 interface. It, it has a full adjacency with VMX4. Uh, here's the IP address of VMX4 that it communicates with. And again, here's the adjacency SID that, you know, represents that adjacency. Now, now I can look at this. I can do a show OSPF database. If you really want to get down into looking at the detailed, uh, you know, segment routing information, the node SIDs, the adjacency SIDs, the segment routing global blocks, the prefixes, it's all in the link state database, right? That's what allows us to not need RSVP or LDP to communicate labeling information. We're, we're using the IGP to do that. And that's one of the great benefits of segment routing. So it's stored in the, uh, it uses opaque area, link state advertisements to communicate this information. You need to do uh, a, either a detail or an extensive option. Let me just jump right to it uh, and I can show you some uh, entries in the link state database here. Just so I can get as close. And, and so now that I've enabled segment routing, this is a, a router advertisement from VMX1, 2020.1, right? And I support segment routing. Here's my segment routing global block. Uh, here's my label range, 4,000. Here's our good friend VMX2. Here is my uh, segment routing global block. Here is my range. And again, these are the values that you like to have be common amongst all the routers. And there's, there's VMX3, VMX4, VMX5, and 6. Right, and then you know you'll see some. Here is the extended router LSAs announcing their index values. VMX1 is 101, VMX2 is 102, and all the other nodes now. Since this information is now present in the link state database, all the other nodes can say, okay, the segment routing start label is 800,000. Uh, node 2 is has an index value of 102, so 800,000 102 is the node set. Now I can forward traffic. Let me, let me show you this. Let's look at the routing table. All right. The, uh, let's look at the INET.3 table. Once all this information has been communicated, let, let's see what we have here. In the, these are labeled OSPF routes that can be used now for MPLS forwarding. They are placed in the INET.3 routing table on the VMX1 node and, and to reach, for example, VMX2, right? It has really two paths to get there. There's redundant paths throughout this network, but if it would create an MPLS frame and push a label on there at the top of that MPLS header of 800,102 and forward it out, the active path is out Giggy002. The other nodes, VMX3, 4, 5, and 6, have that same information in here and no, would know how to forward this using these segment routed labels, right? There is no RSVP, there is no LDP running. Segment routing did this for us, OSPF did this for us. So there's an example of just basic uh, OSPF segment routing configuration uh, on a Junos platform. In this learning byte, we configured OSPF to support segment routing on a Junos device. Thank you very much. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.